Good evening. Welcome to the Good Friday Liturgy with St. James Episcopal Church in Skinny Atlas, New York. We are live streaming this evening and thankful to join with those who are worshiping online. I want to say just a word about the gospel reading this evening. Tonight we hear the story of Jesus' crucifixion according to St. John. Historically, this gospel has been misunderstood as an accusation against our Jewish sisters and brothers, blaming them, and sometimes even inciting violence against them because of Jesus' death on the cross. I want to say that this is a wrong interpretation of the scriptures that we do not support. The condition of all humanity is what led to Jesus' crucifixion, and we ourselves stand with the crowds who shouted for Jesus to be crucified. Tonight, we will play that role in the drama. But before we begin, let us pray for the Jewish people who possess an eternal covenant with the Lord, who delivered them from bondage to freedom. Let us pray for continued faithfulness to God's covenant with them, for their flourishing in peace as witnesses to God's sustaining love for safety from all malice and harm, for the fullness of redemption for the sake of God's name, that unity and concord may exist between Israel and the church, Jews and Gentiles in obedience to God's will. Let us pray. God of Abraham, you planted your people Israel as the root and grafted us as wild branches into a single olive tree of praise to you. As we come near to the cross, we lament the history of prejudice and violence we have fomented between ourselves and your faithful people of whom Jesus was born. Bless the children of your covenant, Jew and Gentile alike, as we strive together to attain the fullness of your blessing for the future of the world.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold your family across the world, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The hymn is in the blue hymnal, number 172.
That's your microphone over there. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged, and the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, King of the Judeans, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the people in the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered at his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Judeans cried out, When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Judeans, Here is your king. Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he swept, went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Judeans. Many of the Judeans read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priest of the Judeans said to Pilate, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic, Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Women, here is your son. Then he said to the disciples, Here is your mother. And from that hour, The disciples took her into his own home, 
After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, I am thirsty. A jar of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Judeans did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you may also believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. May my words be of you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The liturgy for Good Friday is unique to this one day in the Christian year. It is on this day that we mark Jesus' death on the cross. The traditional shape of this liturgy focuses on the cross and on prayers for the sake of the world. Over the last two years, we adapted the service to suit live streaming but tonight, because some of us are able to be here in person, we have restored some of the traditional components. We just heard the dramatic reading of Jesus' crucifixion as told by John. In a few moments, we will have the opportunity to come forward and kneel here at the cross And we will invite those worshiping online to kneel as well. After we reverence the cross, we will pray on behalf of the world. Some of you are no doubt familiar with the practice of kneeling to show reverence to the cross, but for others, this practice will be unfamiliar and perhaps even uncomfortable. So I want to offer some thoughts about what this practice might mean on this particular day of the year. One of the speakers at our early morning Eucharist earlier this week chose to reflect on the meaning of the cross. And it got me to thinking, what would I say if I were to speak about what the cross means to me? What would you say? For me, the meaning of the cross has changed over the years. At this point in my life, it has taken on a greater sense of mystery. 
In fact, as I ponder Jesus dying on the cross and God raising him from the dead, it seems bigger and more profound than I can really comprehend. You may know that there are a number of theories about the impact of Jesus' death on the cross, how his death changed the relationship between God and humankind. In scripture, there are a wide variety of statements and images about Jesus' death on the cross. Jesus didn't actually explain what would be accomplished by his suffering and death. So if we're honest, we don't really know for sure. What Jesus did say was it is finished. In the sense of something being brought to completion or even perfection. But even on that, Jesus didn't elaborate. So let's do some pondering together. Often people say that Jesus died so that our sins could be forgiven, like some kind of cosmic transaction took place because of Jesus' death. But I've been wondering if instead Jesus was showing us what forgiveness looks like. Remember Jesus said, forget, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So while Jesus was suffering in terrible agony, he chose to offer forgiveness without anyone asking to be forgiven or saying they were sorry or deserving to be forgiven. In that moment, Jesus gives us a profound example of what forgiveness looks like. But think about this. The cross also shows us what God's forgiveness looks like. It's as if God is saying to us, you can do even this. You can torture and murder my only son and I will keep on loving you. Imagine that the cross is God's way of saying, nothing you can do is beyond my love for you. Nothing you do can separate you from me. The cross shows us the depth and persistence of God's love and the extent of God's forgiveness. There's a word that theologians use when talking about the meaning of the cross. The word is atonement. The dictionary defines atonement as reparation for an offense or injury. To make retribution, to pay a price in order to right a wrong. But listen carefully. That is not the kind of forgiveness that Jesus offered to those who killed him. The forgiveness he offered was just a free gift. With that in mind, I want to suggest that we think about atonement in a different light. If you actually take that word and divide it into syllables in such a way, it sounds like this, at one meant. At one meant, to be made one. What if the cross was about being made one? 
When Jesus was born, it was the Son of God taking on human form. Jesus became one with us. By living as a human being, the Son of God completely identified with our experience of life. When Jesus died on the cross, he completed that act of identification, going so far as to experience death itself. Jesus became one with us. But there is at least one other, if not more, ways in which the cross makes us one. Second century bishop and theologian Irenaeus said, Jesus became what we are so we might become what he is. What if the cross was putting back together something that had been separated? Restoring something that had been torn or broken. Imagine the cross as the moment through which we are once again able to have a relationship with God that is like that of Jesus. We are drawn again into oneness with God by God's great love for us. This week I read an article about atonement in the Anchor Bible Dictionary of all places. And they asked a question that is intriguing to think about. How have the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus changed the human situation? Thinking about that question is another way of considering what the cross means to you. What changed because Jesus was born and walked this earth? What changed because Jesus died on the cross and because God raised him from the dead? I invite you to consider coming forward to give thanks for the cross, to give honor to the cross. If you choose to come forward to kneel here or along the altar rail to pray beside this cross, if, you, if those of you at home choose to kneel and pray with the image of the cross, Perhaps what you think about as you pause is what the cross means to you and how the world was changed by Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. In a moment, when the music starts, I invite anyone who would like to to come forward and kneel at the rail to touch the cross, to pray, or to do so wherever you are.
dear people of God, our Heavenly Father sent his Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, that all who believe in him might be delivered from the power of sin and death and become heirs with him of everlasting life. As the cross draws us to new life in Christ, let us pray for all who stand in need of grace, hope, and life. Let us pray for the Church of Christ throughout the world. May all your people be whole and one. I invite your prayers for the Church throughout the world. Let us pray for all nations and peoples of the earth and for those to whom their care is entrusted. By God's help, may they seek justice and truth and the well-being of all people. I invite your prayers for leaders throughout the world. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body, mind, or spirit. May God in his mercy protect, comfort, and restore all for whom we pray and grant them the knowledge of his love. I invite your prayers for all those in any kind of need. Merciful God, creator of all the peoples of the earth and lover of souls, have compassion on all who do not know you as you are revealed in your Son, Jesus Christ. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not heard it. Turn the hearts of those who resist it and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray, that there may be one flock under one shepherd, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us commit ourselves to God and pray for the grace of a holy life that with all those who have departed this world and have died in the peace of Christ and those whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter unto the fullness of the joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life in the day of resurrection. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, 
carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Let us pray together, saying the words our Savior Christ has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, it was not the nails that held you to the cross, nor was it our sin. Our sin could not compel God to do anything at all, much less nail God's own self to a cross if God did not so choose. No, it was your love, Lord Jesus, that held you there, your love for us. Your love is what makes this day good. Thank you, Lord, for loving us so much that you stretched out your arms on the hard wood of the cross, that all the world might come within your loving embrace. It is in your name that we pray. Amen. The congregation may be seated and leave in silence when you are ready. <laughs> 